we're creating about as many jobs as those other metros combined. So Ben hates to be compared to Boulder. We could have a whole hour conversation about this, but I think it sets us up another kind of foundation for our uh, region performing well. You know, it's pretty forward thinking, you know, developments for an old busted up sawmill town, right? So I'm here with Roger Lee. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. Um, I think this will be a fun discussion, and I think you're the, you know, appropriate person for the discussion that I want to have today about, you know, where lies, you know, where lies the magic that made Central Oregon such a, you know, dynamic and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, I was actually interviewing Jim Shell, um, who's, you know, he's obviously a community leader here in town. And he said, you're a modest guy and you're going to you're going to shirk at this this title. Uh, but he titled you the architect of the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Bend or Central Oregon. Yeah. Jim and I have a little bit of a, a beef about that with each other. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Well, I have a, I also have a saying that uh, any successful economic development is a team uh, team effort. So sure. <laughs> well, true to form, you uh, you shirk the, the title. But, um, you know, so you're the CEO of the Economic Development Council for Central Oregon. Um, which has been responsible for economic strategy for the area, recruitment of businesses, and expansion of the commercial air services, correct? Yeah, which yeah. is, again, also a team effort with yeah. other organizations. Yeah. Sure. So um, obviously, Roger's at the forefront of what we're seeing here. So, um, you know, you're, you're right in the center of that entrepreneurial world and all that collaboration um, that, is, that has made Ben so great. So, you know, Ben in Central Oregon. So before we get too deep into it, you know, I'd love to hear kind of what's your origin story for finding Central Oregon? You know, when did you know that this was going to be home? Um, did you grow up here? You know, how, how did this how did you how did you come here? Yeah, as I think most people we talk to, they, they, they came here, had it on a list. Uh, that list uh, included, you know, some peers that you probably sure. uh, see um, in your work as well. And uh, we wound up winning on that list. And they said, okay, we're going to make a life here. And we're going to move here without jobs. I was one of those people that moved for a job. So okay. I actually one of the uh, few, yeah. Yeah, relocated from uh, Northeast Oregon. I'm okay. originally from Idaho. Okay. Uh, so I moved from Baker City to here to take on this job uh, 20 years ago with Edco. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, most of the people that I find, um, you know, they came here to make their own way. They didn't have a job to come for. That's 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 interesting. Well, you know, it's that's changing. There's a lot more people that have that are attracted to that, uh, you know, that vibrant, especially tech and, you know, bio biotech world that we have going on right now. But, you know, 20 years ago, most people weren't coming here for a job. Yeah. And I, I had some affinity for the yeah. area. I um, living in Oregon and Baker City. Um, I got to be friends with the people who were doing economic development over here. I actually did a little business, business recruiting yep. uh, uh, in the Bend area in Central Oregon uh, when I was in Baker City, it being that much more of a larger city at that time even. And so um, it wasn't you know completely un, uh, foreign to me, but I actually visited here for the first time um, in the uh, early, early 90s. Okay. And uh, my my brother had gathered the family at, uh, at Sun River actually, okay, uh, for a little holiday get together family reunion, and uh, uh, it was it was pretty interesting driving in. It's like nothing, 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 yep. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's mountains, oh, there's trees, yep. uh, and then there's a huge amount of traffic. This was prior to the Parkway being built, okay, yeah. And I was like, where did all these people come from? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I had a great time in, in Sun River, but. Uh, I'd never thought I would actually live in this area. Okay, so kind of unexpected. So, so you have a you live in Tumalo, right? I do. Yeah, you have a, a ranch out there. Uh, what's your you know What's your family? Do you have kids? Yeah, yeah I got a Give, couple. Share a little bit with you yeah know, your background. I uh, actually met my wife here. Okay, um, we, we like to joke with our kids until we took them to the actual for an anniversary recently and took them to the tavern. But we we tell people we met in a tavern. Okay, it happened to be Pine Tavern, yeah, which sure. is a well established you know fine eatery here yeah, in town. Yeah. And we met for lunch, and uh, so I actually. Found more than a job when I came to uh, uh, to Central Oregon, and uh, we've got two kids, uh, twelve and uh, fourteen. Nathan and Catherine, uh, or uh, one's a middle schooler, one's uh, a freshman in high school. So, yeah, they're uh, we're we're doing the family thing. And yeah. uh, when I met my wife, she said uh, I asked her why she had moved here because she moved here uh, recently as well. I'd been here about a year, and she said it's a great place to raise kids. And I was like, oh well, how many kids do you have? And, yeah. She says, well, I don't have any kids. So, oh, you're a planner. So okay. she wanted to raise a family in Central Oregon. That's <laughs> she was exactly, ready. Yeah, exactly what we're doing. So, 
Well, that's great. Yeah, you know, I've got my three kids. We moved here with two of the three and had our third kid here. And uh, we were attracted for for the same reason. You know, it's such an amazing place to raise kids. Um, but what was so interesting about Central Oregon for me is that not only was it, you know, this beautiful place with natural resources from rivers running through downtown to snow-capped peaks in the back, um, but it was also the, you know, progressive uh, business climate here that I had never seen um, in, in an environment this small. You know, it was it's it's that lightning in a bottle. So here we are in Central Oregon. We've got 150,000 people out here in the middle of nowhere. We're we're hours from anything, um, but yeah, it was incredibly progressive. And there was this long term planning and a, and all these you know movements you know like Edco, um, you know, working to bring in businesses from all over the West. And and that was absolutely shocking for me. And it, it took a while to sink in, you know, how unique it was. Yeah, um, yeah. And 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 so that's what I kind of wanted to discuss today. So, you know. Um, you know, Bend is all, Bend Central Oregon has always been regularly recognized as one of the most diverse economies uh, for growth. You know, I, I, the Milken Institute continually ranks us at you know the very top for job growth in the nation. You know, and this is comparing us to similar metro uh, cities across the, the nation from. Bozeman to Boulder to Austin, you know, all through, but yet we continually rank at that top for job growth. So obviously, you know, that that's a little bit newer. And I think it was probably a little less job growth or diversity in the job growth 10, 20 years ago. Um, but help me understand kind of how that happened. You know, something like that doesn't magically happen in the middle of Central Oregon. Yeah, we're getting asked about this in various parts of the country and world. Yeah. I'm actually speaking next week uh, down in California. Okay. What's happened here. Um, uh, but more and more folks are saying, well, you know, how did you do this? And I call it the 40 year overnight success. Okay. Uh, and the fact that, uh, really the groundwork was laid here a long time ago. And it really started off when we lost our primary, um, reason for being as an economy, our mills closed. Sure. Um, and, uh, we, we had a huge impact that was, um, really out of the control of people locally, uh, to, to change it. And, You've seen this across the West where these community resource based communities uh, either have or have not made a transition to something else. Yep. And uh, in that um, period of time, folks that were in leadership positions here, both on the public and private side, said, hey, they're creating this new land use uh, system in Oregon. Um, it's going to be really unique in the nation. Um, and one of those has a provision for creating destination resorts in the rural area. OK, it's, a, it's an opportunity yeah. to create a real high amenity high quality um, uh, visitor experience that most rural communities can't offer. And this was part of the land use laws that were put in the early 70s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, Deschutes County was one of the few counties to raise their hand and say, we want that. Yep. I mean, we want an opportunity to expose uh, people from the outside to this area um, and with the hope that we can build this tourism industry, but with the hope that that tourism industry can build something else. Okay. So it wasn't so just a ladder. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't okay. just a, uh, we're going to replace, uh, uh, timber jobs with tourism and okay. everything's going to be grand. It's more, let's expose people. We need a robust tourism, tourism industry to do that. Let's set up some mechanisms to make sure that's successful. Yeah. And that is a means to the end. And, uh, I think that continues really today. It's not that we are trying to be a Tahoe or a Jackson hole or Aspen Vale. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to be a real community with, both yeah. middle wage jobs, families, et cetera, which is very difficult in those other places where there's kind of a have and have not kind of a situation going on. Yeah, um, without question. Especially the, you know, the, the real high end uh, kind of destination resorts there. Um, and it's just been fascinating to see how many people walk in our office. So we generate our, a lot of our own leads, but how many people that um, uh, actually contact us and say, hey, I've been visiting this area for 10, 20, 30 years. Yep. And I've really, I've been trying to figure out a way to get back here. Yep. Um, and I'd like, I'm interested in moving my business. Um, I'm interested in starting an enterprise. Uh, help me out. How do we, you know, how do I do that? Yeah. So this is a perfect time to talk about what is the Economic Development Council for Central Oregon? Is it, is it public? Is it private? And, and what's your role in, in this ecosystem? Yeah. So we're fairly unique uh, in the state. We're among a smaller group of economic development organizations. Most are public. Okay. So um, it's not unusual to hear people say, oh, well, what part of government are you? Yeah. But we're not. We're a private corporation uh, managed by 
um, a professional staff and led by a, a mostly private sector board of directors. Okay. I have one of the larger boards uh, in the Central Oregon area. I think okay. I have 46 or 47 board members currently. Okay. But they wow. represent primarily business leaders. Um, there are public leaders there as well. And then we do contracts with uh, public entities, our cities, counties, um, to essentially offer economic development services um, locally. And so um, also relatively unique, um, I think, for organizations like ours. We have six offices in the region that actually um, uh, implement um, economic development activity locally. So we help companies move, start and grow here. OK. Um, and uh, really, essentially, our charge from the community has been to um, number one, we want jobs. We've had this huge in migration of people that are moving here. Uh, many without jobs, and so it's trying to keep pace with that. Yep. Um, but we also want a diverse mix of industries that are able to withstand the economic cycle better than we have historically here. Yeah, so, I mean, all kinds of good things in there that we could unpack, but, you know, talk about, you know, using tourism as a means to end to develop a dynamic job base, which we have now. I've never, I, I have never heard it phrased that way. And, you know, it's interesting, a lot of these, you know, smaller Western towns, which you reference, they only have one or two legs on that stool holding it up. And, you know, I was back in Colorado when the economic, you know, the Great Recession started in 2008, 2009. And overnight that, you know, steamboat where I was living became a ghost town. Yeah. And, um, you know, you'd walk into a restaurant and it would be completely empty. You would literally be the only person sitting at a table just because the only thing that they had going on in their economy was tourism. Yeah. And it works in good times, um, but it creates a service economy where there's not a lot of upward mobility for people. There were the have, the have nots. Um, and then there was a there was a there was a definitive line in between the two. And and what was frustrating for us as a young family is we would see turnovers of families every 24 months. They would come for the dream, for the lifestyle, struggle, get nowhere. They're living in a one bedroom condo for four hundred thousand dollars and they finally throw up their hands and move back to Denver and, and give up. And and to see these families disrupt their kind of trajectory was was tough on us. And and, you know, when we came to Bend and in, in, in the teeth of the gale of our the recession, there was still money moving through the ecosystem. Yeah. You could see it in the restaurants. You could see it in the there was there was construction going on. You know, when I came here and I saw in Northwest Crossing, I saw, you know, trusses being put on a house in 2009 and 10. I, we were probably one of the only places building houses. And prices were selling for way above, uh, you know, anything that was uh, in other kind of peer markets on sure. a per square foot basis. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So to, you know, to, to, uh, to, to see the, the dichotomy and on, on what, you know, tr what you just referenced truly means was, was interesting. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I think that, you know, roles of, of what you do, you know, your role is, is uh, hopefully is, is appreciated in the market. <laughs> I know that's, that's not your, uh, your motive, but um, you know, I, I want to, you know, especially make this public. And, you know, I work with a lot of people that moved to Ben for the first time and, and Ben made its way. It made room for me. It makes room for a lot of people. And it provided a lot, you know, there's, you know, you were talking about, you're making sure to that the jobs are here for when someone comes here, there's going to be enough jobs, you know, and I came in as the, the naive person and say, okay, I'm going to make my way here. And of course there's opportunity and I can grit it out, but you know, to do that in a town where there aren't councils like economic development council, <laughs> you know, thinking 10, 20 years ahead of me, you know, I can only go so far. So, I, you know, I just want to kind of express gratitude. And I think there's a lot of people that are new to town that really need to recognize kind of all the, the foundation that was put in yeah. in place. And, and that didn't obviously happen overnight. Well, thanks for recognizing that. I have a lot of gratitude for coming into a community that was receptive for, for change. Okay. Because yeah. a lot of what this growth means is change. Sure. And uh, if you uh, survey a, a lot of the folks in uh, rural parts of the U.S., certainly parts of the rural West. Yeah. Change is not always something they're, they may like to talk about, but when it actually comes, they're not super excited about it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I've noticed about not only, um, you know, kind of the city that has the most uh, uh, kind of notoriety of Bend, but the communities throughout the area, they're yeah. pretty open to change. And yep. they're embracing that to say, hey, we need to, we need to change or we're going to die. Yep. Um, where I think that's maybe that realization hasn't taken hold um, and have been internalized in other parts of uh, of the rural West that 
yeah. um, and maybe aren't struggling because we're, it's a really interesting model because you have places like, like Boulder, for example, yeah. that is right next to a, a major metropolitan area. Yeah, you got a couple million people there. Yeah. Um, we are not next to anything. Yeah. We are <laughs> kind of aware, yeah. out here on our own. And I was certainly driven home when I first visited the area, you know, and had my four hour commute through, uh, you know, nothingness. Sure. Um, uh, to get here is that, you know, we're kind of on our own. We're kind of need to self-determine. We don't have a lot of political clout. Yep. Um, we don't have a lot of, you know, federal or state resources flowing in here. So it's been, it's been awesome to see that really that's that, um, spirit of self-determination, I think, create what is here today. Yeah. And really what is with this organization too. It's like, Hey, if we want to go do something, let's just go figure it out. And that has come back to, um, uh, industry development, what kind of what kind of economic development we're doing. I mean, it was when I first started, we really weren't doing anything around entrepreneurship. Yeah. But as we saw so many people moving here without jobs and saying, hey, I want to start this business. I've always thought about doing this. Yeah. Um, we realized quickly we didn't have the resources around to really support those businesses, especially like uh, maybe some of our peers in larger cities had. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, well, if, if we're missing some of those elements, let's go out and see if we can create them. Let's get a group of uh, experienced folks, which I think one of the things that's really grown upon me, because I, I didn't expect to be doing this work for 20 years in Central Oregon. Okay. I expected to be here in the kind of three to three to five year time frame, um, on to the next thing and the next community. Um, but what's really grown on me is the people. Okay. Um, it's a beautiful place. Yep. I knew it was a beautiful place, but I moved from a beautiful place. Well, there's a lot of beautiful places. Yeah, yeah there are, uh, especially in my opinion, in the West, but yep. you know, across this, this, uh, this great country. But, um, but the people is really, I mean, you you touched upon it, just the phenomenal talent that, that chooses to make this place yeah. home. And it's not a pass through for them. Yeah. It's like, no, I've looked around or I've lived in big cities and I've kind of done my time. Yep. Um, you know, very a, a lot fewer people have moved from smaller, smaller places like sure. I did. Most of them are coming from larger metro areas and they're like, this is really what, you know, what I was hoping that I would find um, and what I found. Yeah. And, uh, and this is where I want to raise my kids or this is what I want to, you know, finish out my career or whatever it is. They're not here for the short term. Yeah. Or if you're in the Bay area, you're there to make some money, yep. save as much as you can and then get out and maybe live, live life. Yeah. Um, and you see that we see that with a lot of young families, but, um, people here are pretty committed yep. and then they're also willing to roll up their sleeves and do stuff. Okay. And, and one of the assets that we, you know, came around for those entrepreneur entrepreneurs were um, you know, looking to launch businesses is they, they didn't have all the answers, but really do they in any market do, yeah. uh, does a founder have, you know, know how to do everything. And so bringing alongside some of those uh, experts that were willing to donate their time yeah. is a big part of you know, the support we've wanted to provide um, on the entrepreneurial front. And then obviously we need money. You need capital. Yeah. And so where does that come from? Yeah. So, you know, when we first got uh, kind of exposed that this was something that we needed to invest time and resources into, you'd say, well, I know this person in Portland or Seattle, or in some cases it was the East Coast, you know, go to, go to Boston or, yeah. you know, to find this equity capital because it's, it is a unique thing. You've got bank capital and then you've got equity capital and yeah. they're vastly different. Sure. Uh, different risk levels. Yeah. Um, different, you know, regulatory environments and so forth. And we just had virtually none of that. It was, you had to know someone and it was formalizing that in a bigger way um, that we made our focus. And so we went out and recruited a fund manager, a gal named uh, Julie Harrelson, okay. who started up then Cascade Angels mm -hmm. um, and had experience doing this in the Portland area. And it's now uh, Cascade Seed Fund. Um, and then, you know, through the efforts of others, again, this team effort, uh, effort is, is a big theme of the work that we do. Sure. Volunteers got together, private business folks, and said, let's do this showcase of what's happening with early stage companies. We know we're small. Yeah. We're no little undersized, but let's make ourselves look a little bigger. Okay. And we'll have this, uh, this uh, investment conference called uh, the Ben Venture Conference. Sure. And Which is so, now huge. Yeah, it's really grown over the years. And they recruited in through personal relationships, some really interesting people that were panelists and kind of advisors and would critique the companies, but also give kind of a bigger perspective. Well, one of those folks was a guy named Dino Vendetti. Yep. Dino had spent some time up in the uh, 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 Seattle area and then was working in the Bay in the Menlo Park, you know, yep. right in the center of all the action. But um, had spent a lot of time in Alaska as well. So had an affinity for kind of a mountain town. Yep. Eventually wound up moving here and started 
uh, uh, Seven Peaks Ventures. Yep. So uh, pretty uh, pretty interesting couple of developments that happened that they're not fully dedicated to just investing in companies locally. Yep. But they they're a place to go to that's in town. Hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And they can provide advice. And then they later uh, established a private um, accelerator uh, um, that it, it continues today, mostly focused on tech. So it was building some of these resources around that. You know, we didn't have really co-working spaces then, so it was helping organizations like uh, Bentech. Yeah, we've had several open this year. Yeah, I think we're up to 10 or 11 now. It's incredible. And, and the dynamic energy, I was in Bentech Center a week or two ago, and just the, the, the synergy and, and the, the, the cross-pollination between all these different people. And I mean, it, it feels like you're in downtown San Francisco. It's, it's wild what's happening yeah. over there. It's really cool to see companies form even out of those connections where they, these would be people working remotely out of their, you know, their den or their basement. Uh, um, now they're working together with, and they're saying, oh, well, I have, I have this expertise, you have that expertise, let's start a company. Well, and the spinoff effect of, of all the way through, you know, from, from hydro flask to drink tanks to, you know, what I'm looking at right now with Bee Bottle that Drew Bledsoe, you know, lives here, is now a part of it. And it's just, you know, it, it's creating layers of industry that it's, it's phenomenal. And, yeah. and, and what I'm hoping is, is that, you know, we, we, we have enough legs under that stool now so that when we do hit the next nationwide, you know, economic challenge, that we're going to be more resilient. And I can't help but to believe to th that, that we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think there was it was a big wake up call and recession happened yeah. here. We have we had had lots of support from both the private and public sector for this organization, the work that we did, which was all about diversification and creating a base of industries that wasn't tourism, that yeah. wasn't uh, necessarily around the building and construction industry. Um, and uh, I think everybody said, oh, yeah, now we get what you mean. Yeah. Because those industries were really hard hit. You know, tourism took a huge uh, huge um, uh, downturn and all that disposable income. Yeah. And obviously our construction uh, industry was pretty reliant um, on what was happening here. And then we had the double whammy or triple whammy of having uh, uh, a lot of, still a lot of uh, construction materials built here yeah. and shipped across the country. Um, we still have, uh, you know, a, a base of industries for that um, here, mostly in building products yeah. and wood products and so forth. But, um, but yeah, I think the people just like, okay, now we get it. Now we'll put some gas in the tank uh, for you guys to kind of do what you need to do. And we learned lessons too. I mean, uh, certainly not perfect information out there about how to do this work. Yeah. It's, I, I love the comment in, the, in our industry. It's when you've seen one community, you've seen one community. So it's really <laughs> sometimes hard to apply everything unilaterally, uh, even though it may be successful in one area. Um, but we found, we spent a lot of time and effort working on the supply chain and working on uh, building a base of manufacturers in aviation aerospace. Yeah, and the whole aviation space and the airport, I think, are a subject unto itself on how important that is to Ben or Central Oregon. Yeah, general. we really view them as kind of, uh, they're related, but you've got the industry of, of kind of manufacturing pieces and parts as well yeah. as full aircraft yeah. to the transportation asset that our um, our airport is and the connection with the rest of the world, given how, how isolated we are. Um, but that aviation aerospace industry really um, nationally, even internationally, um, was hit hard hit after 30 years, a 30 year run of yeah. really you know positive gains and so yeah. forth. So we learned our lesson in that to say, OK, well, we're not going to just put all our eggs in maybe a couple baskets, but we're really focused, um, which common wisdom wouldn't say is possible on 10 industries right now. Yeah. Okay. And that base is, that's not a, hopefully not a two or three legged stool, but a uh, multi yeah. uh, legged, you know, uh, table or whatever. And so that includes things like uh, administrative centers and headquarter operations, things that could be located anywhere in the nation, but we're going to have them here. Um, advanced uh, manufacturing, which is kind of a catch all for a lot of things that don't fit neatly in under other industries, okay. but it's actually manufacturing things. Okay. Um, Aviation aerospace is certainly continues to be a part of that. Yep. Um, bioscience has seen huge growth here. Some of our best jobs, uh, best paying jobs and uh, kind of most stable industries have been in bioscience. So if you take all the PhDs in Oregon, for example, that are doing pharmaceutical research, about half of them would be here, um, yep. which is pretty shocking to think about. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and some really some national, international companies who come in and purchased and continue to expand operations here, though, even though they have global operations. And they yeah, can. I mean, Lonza just came in and bought, well, what was Bend Research, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, that's a 
that's a pretty big coup and, and they're adding jobs weekly. Yeah. Yeah. No, they've continued to expand their facilities. They're doing, they're doing different things too than Ben Research did, which was pretty much a, a research arm of a lot of far, larger pharmaceutical companies. Yep. And now they're starting to get into some of that manufacturing that, uh, um, or those are super prized jobs. And a lot of places spend millions and millions of dollars trying to recruit those industries, but the building products industry is still pretty decent sized here because okay. it's really grown up, um, you know, with the kind of resurgence of the economy. Brewing and distilling is one that we're well known for. Sure. Um, and it's a big, you know, getting to be a pretty big industry with our all our brewers and distillers here. Um, and then outdoor gear and apparel is one that's uh, it'd be fun to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, that that's, one's growing a lot. Yeah, it's just... Uh, or it's visible. Yeah. You know, I think maybe uh, I was doing some, re doing some looking back on this in another talk I had to give. Um, and uh, seven years ago, I think we had, you know, about two dozen companies here in that space. And now we're in the 60 to 70 range. 60 to 70. Se seven years later. And, uh, you know, some incredible, some, you know, employment approaching a thousand people. And a lot of those are smaller companies, but certainly the hydro of the world and rough wares and, um, you know, companies that really got market traction and, and built their brand um, uh, make up, a, you know, a component of that. And it makes sense. I mean, we're here in an area where you can go test your product and yeah. kind of having the out in the elements. Um, a new one for us is professional services. Um, it doesn't seem all that intuitive, but more and more uh, companies are exporting their their services outside the area. It could be it could be professional search. It could be even legal or accounting services. But we're seeing a major a lot of our companies actually have uh, the majority of their clients outside the area. I know wealth management is one that's uh, sure. been around for a while. That's uh, certainly falls in that category too. And then specialty food, which is one that is a real uh, enigma for me because we're high and dry. Yeah, we have a very short growing season. Um, it's a great place to recreate, but maybe not to grow vegetables um, per se. Yeah. Um, but uh, we have these specialty food products cropping up, and uh, there's almost 50 of those companies here now. Yeah. And uh, and then tech, of course, has been kind of got a lot of the headlines. Yep. But you know, 130 tech companies here now. Um, a lot of those in software, but exciting things happening even in hardware and and, and semiconductor uh, manufacturing as well. So it's pretty cool to have that, you know, a town this size with that kind of a base and to have at least like uh, 20 companies in each of those sectors. In some cases, you know, over 100 companies in each of the, in, in, in those to really weather the next um, economic cycle when it comes. Well, I mean, I'm absolutely stunned. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't even realize the breadth and the depth of the, the job creation that we were seeing. I mean, even in real terms of, of job growth, not as a percentage of, I mean, aren't we competing with big cities like Portland as far as real job growth, not as a percentage of population, but as just a number of jobs created? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point that you make. Uh, and this is some of the information we share with the airlines when we're trying to recruit new air service. Yeah. As we actually give the sheer numbers, the, the growth numbers are off the chart for us and there's not a pl faster place uh, uh, you know, as far as growth goes um, in the state of Oregon, and really we're among the fastest in the nation yep. um, when it comes to jobs and GDP growth and, uh, you know, population growth, et cetera. Even wage growth uh, has been up there really high. But when you look at the sheer numbers, it's like, OK, we're smaller. Yeah. But if you exclude the Portland metro area in our own state, which is about nine times our size, um, and you and still include the others, which total make up probably seven or eight times uh, our population base. We're creating about as many jobs as those other metros combined. That are nine times yeah. the size of ours. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's stunning. And, and I, you know, I would, I would care to conjecture that, you know, at these conferences that you're going to, I mean, the tables, you know, the tides turn and, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people coming to you and, and this ecosystem trying to learn some lessons. I mean, are, are we are we the shining star of of job growth and creation at this point in the West? Well, you mentioned the Milken Institute. Yeah. And when you it's been going for 20 years, um, their index that they really rank large and small metros and they do it on this bundle of kind of economic um, prosperity or economic activity. OK. Around GDP growth, around what type of industries, what is going on with wages, what's going on with uh you know, employment, et cetera. Population is actually not part of that. Yep. Um, and they kind of bundle that together and say, okay, here's an index for all these cities. Uh, I think they are tracking a hundred and, or excuse me, about uh, 350, 360 uh, cities across the U.S. 
and uh, you wind up number one once, people are like, oh, oh, I, I, I've been there. Or I know yeah, that yeah, place. Yeah. You wind up two consecutive years, and I'm like, oh, what's going on there? Three? They never had a con- three consecutive years. It's and very, did that just happen? That happened this year, and I, I believe it will, it will probably have a chance at a four, at a four peat. Um, and uh, it's interesting because the folks, the uh, uh, I've got to know the the, the economists at um, the Moken Institute because. We're like, okay, what's going on here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and they've done case studies, and I'd love to talk a little bit about that too, about what they see is different here than other yeah. places. But um, one of their key uh, economists actually is now works for the uh, Heartland Institute. It's part of the uh, Walton Family Foundation, Walmart. Yep. Um, and they're studying, they're, they're interested in the economy and what makes successful places because they want, obviously, build successful communities that have consumers that can spend money, that, sure. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and they've done a little different um, index, uh, and they just they didn't group large and small. They uh, took them all together. It's called the uh, most dynamic metros uh, study that they've just released the first one of uh, this last year. And so it's like 300, uh, 379 metros that they're looking at across the U.S. And uh, Ben ranked number five. And one of their key criteria and the, the kind of premise that they have is that. Um, uh, it's different than the Milken Institute is they are looking at the proportion of jobs that are from young companies. Portion of jobs from young companies. Yeah, okay. Which is something yeah. we, we saw when the, that's a leading indicator of yeah. where this is going. Yeah. We saw this in the, in, in, in the economic downturn, um, that the companies that were creating the most jobs were all ones that were established five or 10 years prior. And so that's why we put a lot of our weight behind the, uh, um, the entrepreneurial effort. Um, and their whole premise is that, well, out of the, in the top 30, there's only two that don't have a real high index, uh, high scoring index on this proportion of uh, jobs coming from young companies. Okay. And Ben ranked super high on that. So um, another top 10 ranking for the community. And this is against even larger metros where you think, OK, that's where that's what's gathering all the, the capital and the young companies and the entrepreneurs and the young adults. Um, yeah. We're actually. We're in the we're in the ring with uh, some pretty heavy hitters uh, and, and all that, so it's pretty exciting. Well, it's 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 incredible. So, you know, to take a step back, and this isn't your 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 job to you know, to fix or to address, but f- what about the people that have come to Ben and said, "Okay, it's perfect. I love the size. Hundred thousand purse people in the city is a perfect tidy." city for me. I can, I can go out and mountain bike out my front door and I can go to 30 breweries and I have a great job enough, you know, you know, there's, what do you say to them? Or what do you say to the people that, you know, were here prior to the boom and they didn't partake in it. They didn't have the right skill sets to partake in the the industry growth that we had. Mm -hmm. And they wanted the very inexpensive, you know, ordinary, you know, Oregon town that didn't experience this type of growth and they kind of feel on the outside of what's going on. You know, how do you, how do you react to that? I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, you, we obviously empathize for that, but you know, that, that's not the framework on which Ben was founded, but mm-hmm. you know, how would you respond to those, those type of people? Yeah, I'd say uh, to keep uh, things as they are or always were is balancing on a knife edge. Okay. It's, it's uh, super difficult to do uh, for any time at all. And, uh, you know, it's back to the old adage, you're either growing or you're dying. Yeah. And that relates to a lot of different things. It's not just in sheer numbers, people or development or whatever, um, but it has to do with what are people doing? Yeah. How are they earning their reason, you know, earning money? And if, I think if we were the folks that maybe uh, our long-term residents were saying, Hey, I, I really wish the mills were back. And we had those types of jobs here that didn't require, you know, college educate college education or, you know, advanced degrees. Um, and you could still make you could still, um, uh, you know, buy a house, have a family on one income. Yeah. Um, I'm saying that would yeah, that'd be great as well. But that's not the world today. It's yeah. just not the world today. And the world that we have today and the jobs that we have are not going to be what's going to be in 10, in 10 or even 20 years. It's really a super rapidly changing uh, flywheel we're on right now. Sure. And so it, it, it keeps us on our toes to be able to, to try to, you know, find the next thing. But for those who have moved here and said, this is, um, you know, this is the perfect ideal community. I don't want it to change. Um, I would say, well, you picked it in a snapshot in time and it wasn't this way 10 years ago. It wasn't this way 20 years and it's not going to be that in the future. Um, yes, you you may have more competition for your favorite fishing hole or, your uh, your trail and so forth, but 
Um, whenever I go up on Mount Bachelor and I look down at the town, it's pretty hard to see it. Yeah, it, it just blends into the trees. It's, you, you know, you see the cinder cone of, of Pilot Butte, but that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and people have, have come from other communities like uh, parts of California or Colorado yeah. and other areas that have grown rapidly, even Idaho. And they're like, well, I don't want it to be, I don't want that to happen, what, you know, happen. Sure. Uh, well, number one, we have Oregon land use laws. Which are which are incredibly progressive. I mean, obviously there's probably some stumbling blocks. I was just talking to Kirk Schuller about it, but even he, CEO of the biggest land development company in Bend is pro land use laws. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's pretty unusual. Yeah, it is, because it definitely makes their job harder. Um, yeah. It makes our job harder, but we, we really don't try to put our clients into areas that are already designated for development. Yeah. And there's this kind of concentric circle, uh, you know, methodology around Oregon's land use laws. But the reality is, is that 75% of Deschutes County, for example, is owned by the federal government, either the BLM or the Forest Service. Wow. And so that's really off limits for development. Yeah. So if you're worried about your open space, uh, you know, getting eroded in a major way, don't, because it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. It's not going to happen in my kid's lifetime. Yeah. I mean, this, these are areas that are pretty much protected. Now, you may not go to be able to go to Sparks Lake and have that you know magical experience where the only person on the lake. Yeah. You may have to go to those other lakes that uh, yeah. um, you know are maybe more off the beaten path. But there, I think that's one of the things that uh, people say is unique about our region too is that everything's so doggone close. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be in nature, if you want to be kind of in the mountains or in the desert, it's a it's a thirty minute drive, if that. Oh yeah, maximum. And, yeah, so that next lake is another ten minutes away. Yeah. And, uh, and I think in most frame of reference for people who are coming from other parts, they're like, that's not an inconvenience for me. It may be an inconvenience for the locals who are used yeah. to going to those spots um, and you know not seeing another person, but I'm sorry to say those that that's gonna change. Yep. Um, and there are lots of other parts of Oregon, not just in our region, where you can still have that experience that are not far away. Yeah. Because quite frankly, nothing is happening in those communities. <laughs> well, and I think that you, so the way you just phrased that, um, you know, if you're not growing, you're on a knife edge and that, you know, we're in a continual, you know, mode of change everywhere, I think was one of the best descriptions. And I want to go back and kind of study what you said. Um, but I'm in full agreement with that. I mean, I think that what we've got here is incredibly unique. And, and all the people that I've met that have been here for a long time are absolutely behind the change. Yeah, and, yeah, it's 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 interesting because yeah. you might think the opposite. You might yeah. think, oh, this you know everything's terrible. But they're like, hey, growing up here, I didn't think I was going to be able to stay. Yeah, because there wasn't going to be anything interesting to do. Yeah, um, you know, and with my free time, and then I couldn't make a living. Yeah, um, and uh, it was hard, you know, be hard to raise a family. And I hear those stories from my my uh, peers in other parts of uh, uh, rural America where that's a real problem. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, but I think the foundation of a real healthy um, community that has great nonprofits, that has, you know, public services and all that is a, a super strong uh, economic base. Yeah. And a base with jobs where people can afford to, to live. Well, uh, yeah, I think what we have here is so incredibly unique. And I think it's almost like, you know, an educational process that it's that, that I'm going through that, you know, I assume other people will do as well to understand how truly how dynamic this is. You know, my next interview on this is uh, with Dick Koenig, uh, who runs the Reach Another Foundation, and they're doing big things in Africa and it's based out of Bend. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're trying to, you know, eliminate spina bifida in the whole continent of Africa based out of their, their, the, you know, the brain trust of who they're working with and the financial resources right here out of Bend. I mean, that's, cool. it's incredible, you know, but then, you know, you were, you were referencing the natural resources. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. You know, I can be at my house and in the evenings I'm looking West over the, the Cascades and we have a two and a half million acre wilderness area out my back door. I mean, and I think from almost any other state to, to, to just quantify what two and a half million acres of wilderness <laughs> area are that is cohesive and all together. And then there's a hard stop. And then I turn, you know, I flip in my chair and I, I look at Bend and you're talking about the 10 legged stool of economic growth. I mean, to have that, 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 you know, interface is, is, I don't think there's anything like it. Right. It's pretty unique. I mean, we're getting called by a lot of mountain towns that are yeah, that are the one trick pony that have really tourism and the seasonality that comes with that saying, hey, how can we do something a little different here? Yeah, because um, we do have some talent in those areas, too, that they want to try to capitalize on. But um, 
I will say that uh, what the Milken Institute, maybe unpack that a little bit, has, did kind of a separate study to say, okay, well, why did this, why is this place so dynamic? And why yeah. is it, you know, why is it showing this resiliency and kind of high, uh, cons consistent high performance? And uh, they really attribute it to the fact that um, there is a kind of a collaborative uh, That's way all of I doing hear. things Keep here. Keep on hearing collaborative. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, it comes down to when people move to the area and they're like, hey, I'm, in, you know, I'm, I'm looking for work. I'm yeah. looking for opportunities. Uh, who can you connect me with? And, um, you know, I'll give them names of folks. A lot of times these are the owners or founders or CEOs of the companies. And they're like, I can't believe it that you referred me to that person. And they and they they had a meeting with me. I don't yeah. know these and they give me a job. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, to, to develop some opportunities, but they're just so floored that people would actually take time. And I think one of the key reasons is, is comes back to this intentionality of people intentionality picking this place to live, and they were in their same shoes some time ago. Yep. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'll play it forward. I'll, I'll uh, or, I'll, or maybe I'll pay it back. I'll uh, somebody did that for me when I came, and I'm gonna do that for for them. And it, it's a much different dynamic. It reminds me a little bit in some cases. Um, on just the kind of in-migration we've had here of what they have in a place like Alaska. Yep. Because Alaska, people come and go all the time. Sure. And so I think one of the first questions, if you're in Anchorage, for example, you're gonna ask, oh, where are you from? Yeah. Because there's so few like, you know, local residents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are coming in and out a lot for the energy industry. And, um, and I think that's a question people ask here. Oh, where did you move from? Yep. And they're accepting and it's not like, oh, you moved from out of town. Well, we're gonna give you five or 10 years before we kind of feel like you're, you know, we're, we'll give you the time of day. Yeah. yeah. Before you're, uh, you know, you're kind of given some credibility and so forth. And that's a kind of, uh, whether it's a big city, quite frankly, in my experience, yeah. or whether it's a very small town, uh, that can kind of be the mentality of like, oh, well, you know, we'll see how you work out instead of saying, oh, we're glad you're here. What do you like to do? Yeah. What did you, you know, what are you doing while you're here? And how are you, I think a really interesting question that, um, It'll be interesting to see as this place grows, if this will continue, but it's like, well, what are you doing with your free time? Yeah. Which is, I don't think maybe a question people ask much when they're in other parts of the country. It's like, well, what do you do for work? Yeah. I don't, you know, and kind of how many kids do you have? And instead of, well, what are you involved with? It doesn't involve making money yeah. or taking care of your own. Well, yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and what you're, you're talking about it, and I would love to unpack a little more. What does it mean to be a citizen of Central Oregon? You know, you know, because like you were saying, you know, so often it's just measured in years or how long you've been here. I think it's different here. I think, you know, you can be a s proud citizen of Central Oregon day one and include it. But, but, but why and what does that mean? You know, what are the responsibilities that, you know, come with with living here? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, probably lots of different answers out there. Yeah, I, I would say sure. uh more and more, I, I characterize it as, as how people are engaged. Yeah. You know, well, that's great. I'm glad you're, you know, you got a great job. Maybe it's, you're even working remotely for someone else, which we have a lot of remote workers yeah. here. But, um, you know, what, what, are your pa what are your passions? What are you doing yeah. around those passions? And how are you getting engaged really to make a place better even than when they came? Well, and that's where, you know, when I finished my conversation with Jim Shell, you know, I was just, I was, chock full of guilt about you know he's he's running all these boards and all these mentorship programs and jim and can do that to you he's a yeah well he's a mentor for a hundred people and here i am and I've, I've come you know i've now been in, in ben for a decade and i'm like i'm not giving enough back you know i i've taken more from this than i've given back and that's where i feel my head going and where you know i feel i owe it to the you know the town to to open that door and open those opportunities for other people. And, you know, I still need to figure out my way, but, you know, I think that's kind of a commonality and a theme that everyone I've talked to from Kirk Schuler on up is, says the same thing. You know, somebody opened the door. You just said it, somebody opened the door for them. They're going to open the door for somebody else. Yeah. And I don't know if there's many places like that, you know, and uh, I was actually just in Utah a couple of weeks ago and I was, I was speaking with some of the locals there and there's definitely a, uh, you know they have a chip on their shoulder and 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 they're in this in they're in this uh business environment and be, you know they're in a beautiful place that has some business but it's not this upwardly mobile hmm. you know ladder and and they definitely get pigeonholed into how far they can grow they struggle there's the have they, there's the have not and then even when the locals come in they're not opening the door for anybody there's this scarcity mindset right yeah, you know yeah. and they're like i've got my job but there's not many and and they don't necessarily want anyone else coming to the town and and um 
it's 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 just a completely different vibe and and it's 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 interesting to have this discussion because i've always tried to figure out why everyone here is so darn friendly yeah you know and it's probably because there isn't a scarcity there isn't a scarcity of opportunities for jobs there isn't a scarcity of opportunity for your home and your house life and where you're going to put your kids in school there's there's a little bit of room for everybody right yeah it's it's a great point and something i experienced quite frankly in a big city where there is a very much a scarcity and a scarcity of time. Yeah. And so you're like, well, I'm only going to make friends with so many people because there's lots of other people behind them that yeah. I just don't have time for where I don't see that mentality here where people are kind of like, well, Hey, you like to do this? Well, you should know so-and-so. Yeah. Um, and so there's kind of this sharing of information and friends and contacts that um, I, I think it is pretty unique. It comes back to the reason why, you know, I'm still here. Yeah. And why we've really called this place home is that it's uh, pretty special in that way. Well, I think we're kind of closing in on this, so we don't need to go too much further. Is there anything else you wanted to discuss today or? Well, you know, I, we kind of touched on it, yeah. but um, one of the, I think the key assets that um, we recognized early and, the, and our companies made very clear to us, yeah. especially the tech companies are like, if you don't do anything else for us, get us good connections to the rest of the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, we don't care about anything else. Workforce, we'll try to take care of on our own. Um, you know, we'll do this, that, and the other to, uh, you know, make our business successful. But Is that planes? Yeah. That was the connection. And so it was air service. And uh, at the time that we kind of went out and did some of those surveys, we, we talked to three or 400 companies every year at their place of business yeah. to kind of identify opportunities and challenges. And um, so we focus on that. And the region is focused on that. It's not just EDCO. The Visitor Association has been hand in glove uh, with, with kind of um, the chambers and EDCO. Um, and, you know, uh, I really feel like the um, uh, uh, airport, it's a public entity, yeah. but it's like welcoming all that help. Yeah. And so when we go to meet with airlines, uh, we go together. Yeah. And we don't, if we can't go together, we don't go. Um, it's not like, oh, well, you can carry it this time. We always have that kind of representation. And this is about the season when we go do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess it, it gets noted uh, by the airlines. Because we don't walk in saying, hey, if you create this new service, uh, people will use it. We come with data. Yeah. We come with a performa and a way for those airlines to make money. It's the same kind of business development approach you would if you were launching an enterprise. And um, there's hardly a place you'll find that's got better air service for our size. Incredible. Or that's been growing faster. Yeah. You know, I think we're, we're, we are set to double our um, number of uh, seats available to passengers and passengers in like a four year time frame. So uh, it's remarkable and more, more air service is on the way than we've ever seen in our history, which is we've had some pretty good years for air service. You know, we'll be able to hit, uh, you know, a dozen destinations from, from a, uh, if you're in Bend, uh, a 30 minute drive, if you're in Redmond, a no minute drive. Yeah. Um, and then all the connections that that makes. And we're, we're really excited about some stuff going further east too. So um, that's one of our, been our big focus is, you know, the Chicago flight, the direct flight um, out of... Uh, that just started, didn't it? Or? Just started, yeah. Okay. And then we continue to work on the airlines with uh, from Minneapolis and uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Oh, wow. Um, you know, getting pretty far uh, to the East Coast that way. And it's just for us, we feel like it's a port of call as well. Yeah. For those, you know, travelers getting in and out of here, it's a huge convenience, but it also provides an open door for businesses in those regions to say, oh, well, We've got now a direct connection that's a super easy flight um, into Central Oregon to utilize uh, what we've got going here. And, you know, it's it's not the uh, leading factor that has led to some of the uh, huge tech investments that's happened in Central Oregon. Um, but it sure makes those investments a lot easier to make um, if you've got, you know, an hour flight to the Bay Area and not just one flight, but six or eight flights a day on yeah. three, three different airlines. Well, that's, I think that's the key. A lot of these re small regional airports saying, we, me too, we can connect to eight cities, but it's one flight a day on a, you know, a small, you know, CJ or whatever the, you know, the, the, the little prop in Barbadier planes. It, what we have here is, is incredible. Yeah, you know, to put a story to that, you know, I, I had to fly to New York for some real estate training and I had my selection of half a dozen flights in like a five hour, you know, a five or six hour period to fly to Portland. So I was able to leave my house an hour and 10 minutes before my flight. I drive in, park 100 yards maximum away, high five the security because there's never any line. And I jump on my plane, take a 38 minute hop to Portland, walk down five gates and it was a 30 minute connection. And I was on a direct flight to LaGuardia. 
You know, so, I mean, I was able to transfer to LaGuardia with one little 30 minute layover yeah. and essentially no weight in entering the system. And it was really shocking to me on kind of the, the backside of it is when you have to reverse engineer that system, you can spend hours just getting in these big airports in these cities. And, you know, I often tell people that I can get to downtown San Francisco than people who live in San Francisco live there. You know, it's I mean, almost that's, that's really uh, true. Yeah, and you know, you go on a Friday night flight from San Francisco to Bend, and you know half the plane. It's you know, people went and still have <laughs> business connections there, and they're coming home to mountain bike for the weekend with their family. But you know, you're right. What is that? An hour and a half flight with no wait at the airport and direct to San Francisco, and you know, you take a shuttle into downtown, and and you're in downtown from your house in a couple hours, two and a half, three hours. I mean, it's 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 insane. Yeah, which that convenience, I think, is just going to be ever, ever more important. Yeah. And I think it sets us up another kind of foundation for our uh, region performing well. Yeah. Um, when whatever the next economic cycle brings us. Well, you know, hey, I, I appreciate your time. But more importantly, you know, I'm grateful for all that you've done to, to you know, to provide the opportunity for all the people that came after you. And, um, you know, my goal is to try to pay this forward a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of help spread the word and, and just kind of, you know, the, a gentle nudge for, to, you know, to, to be grateful for all those that came before us and created that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, kind of, you know, so we get to paint our own picture for what Central Oregon looks like in the next 25 years. I mean, it's going to be exciting. It's not going to remain the same, is it? It's not going to remain the same. And yeah. uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, thank you again. Appreciate right. your time, Roger. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks for joining us. This is the Ben Beat, and until next time.